All right, guys, we're going to jump right into this episode five of, of Convicting a Murderer. I'm looking at the chatter online. A lot of people have now been converted to the Stephen Avery is Guilty uh, committee, which I have been hosting. I, I am the head of the Stephen Avery is Guilty committee. And obviously, because we finally jumped into what is at root with the $36 million lawsuit, I'm here with Brandon Tatum, perfect person to have here, former police officer, to kind of take us through what you found to be weird, what you found not to be weird. The first thing that I want to say right off of the top is that police officers rarely conduct a perfect investigation. I don't know why of every field and every category of job and living, people understand that mistakes happen and things are not perfect. When it comes to police officers, it is like, you better have done everything perfect or else you're a dirty cop. And there seems to be nothing in between. Right. I, I think that is the, the misnomer when it comes to the public and them not knowing exactly what is involved in investigations. It's a very broad perspective. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of people involved, a lot of technical things that go on. And most people don't know that unless they do ride-alongs or they are part of the police department. So I think that it's easily um, or it's easy to trick people and to get in a perception of police being fraudulent if there's something missed. And I've done plenty of investigations and I've been a part of major investigations and there's there could be things that are missed and it's normal and it happens. That's why we have qualified immunity. You know, the fruits, if you are, you know, in a court proceeding, if you're acting in good faith, all of those things come into consideration. So I think that that's something that people should consider is that police are not gonna be perfect. And if they're not, that doesn't mean that they're doing something wrong. Right, and I think one of the things that I wanted to stress to people, and they definitely saw this in episode five, is just how small Manitowoc County is. I think a lot of our perception about police officers and police forces really comes from the TV screen. And people just think the FBI swoops in, every, every police force has tens of thousands of people at their disposal. And it's just not that way when you really get to these really small towns, you know? They're relying on the same people. The building is really small. Um, and of course, obviously, with Stephen Avery and this Netflix narrative, these police officers, which I really appreciated sitting down with them, said, hindsight is always twenty twenty. If we knew that Netflix was going to come along and make a docu-series and every Every single thing that we did was going to be under scrutiny. Yeah. I wish we would have done this one thing different. I wish we could have done this. And they and they freely admit that in the docu-series. So let's just first jump into this clip. In case people have not seen episode five, you can see it available on Daily Wire Plus. But the question of people asking why Manitowoc County was involved at all. There's a missing person and the person's car is found in Manitowoc County. So this might be the reason why they were initially involved. Let's watch the clip. I think Making a Murder reviewers came away with the impression that nobody from Manitowoc County was supposed to be involved at all in the Teresa Hallback investigation. And yet, not only were they still very much involved, but they were also the officers that were finding a lot of the important evidence. The department that should not have been involved was very involved. But not only their involvement, um, it's them hiding their involvement. In Making a Murder, Sheriff Pago from Calumet is stating that the only role that Manitowoc played was to provide resources, to provide equipment. When we needed something, they went and got us that. You know, that's all they did. They provided that piece of equipment, and that's their role and their only role in this investigation. But prior to that, the 5th, the 6th, the 7th, and the 8th, I think there were at least three or four where they talked about the role that Manitowoc and other counties played. This wasn't like it was just Calumet and Manitowoc. The place was swarming with cops from almost the very beginning. Our department will be supported by the uh, State Patrol, the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, the state. They have uh, provided uh, numerous agents to aid and provide assistance to our agency in the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. The Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department has been uh, terrific as far as providing local uh, resources, their expertise. Individuals from my agency, individuals from the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, and I have... Nobody ever said to Manitowoc County, hey, you guys, off the property. They were clearly allowed to be on the property because they were on the property. The truth is they were very much allowed to be involved in the investigation. Obviously, it was taking place in their county, but internally, the superiors had decided, maybe let's not lead this investigation. 
By investigation, Calumet County was going to be doing interviews, obtaining subpoenas and search warrants, examining records, and conducting the searches. Manitowoc County was going to assist in that process. For example, if certain resources were needed during searches, they would have manpower that they could provide if, if we needed that. And the Manitowoc District Attorney took it even a step further. Manitowoc County District Attorney Mark Rohr said on the first day of the search of the Avery property that he did not want any Manitowoc County officers on the property without somebody else with them. He did that to avoid any perceived uh, conflicts of interest due to that $36 million lawsuit Avery had filed against the county. All right, thanks, it was Manitowoc County officials that made that decision themselves. No one demanded it or required them to hand over the investigation or required that either Calumet officers or a DCI agent be with them at all times. So if, if the prevailing belief was that officers were somehow involved because they wanted to plant evidence, then why didn't they just lead the investigation themselves like they were allowed to do? So just make that clear again. So Teresa, the phone call comes in that Teresa's missing from Calumet County, and then her car is found in Manitowoc County, obviously, because it's found in Stephen Avery's lot, and this just happens to be where Stephen Avery lives. And the clock is ticking down. They don't know if she's uh, still alive. And to make it clear to people, they had every right. They did not actually have to pass off this investigation. They could have led this investigation. And internally, they said, you know what? Obviously, it's going to look bad if we leave this investigation. We see that her car is here. Public perception is going to be that, oh, you know, why are your hands still here? And so they internally make a moral decision and say, we're going to actually let Calumet lead the investigation. And we're just going to provide manpower because this lot is huge. You know, this woman is potentially still alive. We need to do what we can do and bring in outside forces. And you also see that deceptive editing. They didn't show you that they had freely admitted that in multiple press conferences that Manitowoc County was going to be assisting in the searches. What was your perception of how they handled this as a former police officer? Well, I think they I think if they can go back and change it, they probably would, because it, it still will be a conflict of interest because you have a person who was wrongly convicted even if they were acting in good faith initially. This man was going to do 32 years in prison. Thank God for DNA, he got out. And so what you would want to do, and this is go back to the, go back to the premise that we were talking about before, about the perception of impropriety with police investigations. Mm -hmm. You want to eliminate any chance because in the court of law, the jury is gonna have to, you know, convict somebody beyond a reasonable doubt. And when you have a conflict of interest, it could create a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. And when you have Manitowoc County officers, investigators, ending up finding key crucial um, items of, of, of information that literally led to probably him getting convicted um, would yield a conflict of interest. So I think that it doesn't necessarily mean that they did something wrong or they were attempting to cover up or plant evidence, but it definitely, you know, puts a question mark in people's minds of with all of these agencies there, why did they still need to be involved? With the superiors understanding that this could cause a conflict of interest, mm. we need to have people following them around and making sure that this doesn't look bad. Why wouldn't they just remove them altogether, at least in the investigatory part? holding the perimeter, actually doing resources would be a good option, but having them in, you know, uh, Stephen Avery's home, finding evidence, it, it, it created a storm that probably shouldn't have happened. And in an investigation, you don't want to create that mm -hmm. because then in court, you're going to have an uphill battle and you could get somebody off mm -hmm. that should be convicted. So the way that I run it in my head is I think the exact opposite way, which is if this woman was actually still alive, and the difference between finding her and not finding her as you're running against the clock would have been, why weren't more officers on the property, right? And you say, oh, well, we told all of Manitowoc County, even though this was their county, to take a step back because Stephen Avery was involved, you would have had the same criticism. It would have been, why? You knew this person was missing. You knew that this is where her car was. If you had gotten to her 12 hours earlier, she would have been alive. And all you had to do, there's, in many scenarios, there's no way police can win until you actually know the ending, which is why I think these officers say, hindsight is 2020, right? At this moment, they don't know she's dead, right? They don't actually, they don't know that Stephen Avery is involved. It could have been any other person that was on that property. It could have been his brother, his cousin, his niece. They have no idea. And they're coming into the situation thinking, we're racing against the clock and we're trying to find this young lady. And if I was a person that was potentially distressed and on this property, 40-acre lot, I and even if I'm the parent of someone on this record, I'm like, send every 
single police officer because at the end of the day, you're talking about money. We can deal with the perception and the public versus somebody's life, which I would have been like, this is the priority. We need to find this girl. I think we're on the same page when it comes to that. And I think most people will agree with you on that. I think that they could have been a little more strategic. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about canvassing 40 acres, of course, every officer counts. And and you can, you know, go from there. People would understand that. But when you start getting to a more intimate investigation, meaning that you're going to now go in Stephen Avery's home, Mm -hmm. you know, now now you guys are going to actually physically be in there, even though you have one person supervising you, that person is not sitting there watching every officer and he can't be in two places at one time. Mm -hmm. So I think that they could have um, kept the officers there to to canvas the lot. But then when they knew they were going to go to Stephen Avery's house, they could, I I think they should have slowed down and, and, and kind of re, you know, I I would say reimagine, but they should have uh, tried to reevaluate the tactics. And and this is why you want to do that because you could possibly find evidence that will convict a person and because you are in a conflict of interest, it could paint doubt in the jury pool. Mm-hmm. So obviously in this case, it didn't yield doubt enough to not get him convicted. Mm-hmm. But in the future, as a supervisor, you you want to look at those things because it's not enough to find uh, evidence. You, you want to also make sure you convict this person. And we do it all the time in policing. We have tactical strategies to investigating and we have chain of command. We do all of these things because... The, doing the investigation at the time is not all that you think about. You have to use big picture. Uh, just the same thing with O.J. Simpson. I mean, they, they literally, he literally became a free man. Uh, well, I say he became a free man. You're innocent until proven guilty. They weren't able to prove him guilty because of things that they did on the scene. Mm-hmm. And future investigations teach officers to say, okay, when we do this, we have to make sure we have chain of custody, even in the heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. When we have situations on the police department where there's a murder scene, we we are already thinking about how can we make sure we secure this investigation so we don't mess around and get a killer off Mm -hmm. because we we made mistakes during the investigation. But that's public perception uh, versus actual, the fact, the factual investigation, which is why I think ultimately he was convicted because, like I said, they were allowed to be on the property. So if you're the jury and you're looking at this case and you understand, yes, I'm sure because the Netflix docuseries, people are thinking <laughs> that they're not supposed to be there, but they could have even led this investigation and they didn't. They 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 yielded it and said Calumet lead it. I think you're right that this gave Netflix fuel um, without question. Obviously, we see that because there are still people that are like, well, what were they even doing on the property? They shouldn't have been on the property and things of that nature. But there was a reason that he got convicted and the jury thought they they acted in the right capacity, which I think you'll see more of, especially as we get into Brendan Dassey. The Bible is the root of wisdom, inspiration, and spiritual nourishment. The Hallow app empowers you to explore the Bible's profound teachings and effortlessly incorporate them into your daily life. A great place to start while you deepen your understanding of the Bible is to check out Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a Year, available now on the Hallow app for brief daily readings and reflections. Here you can dive into an extensive library of Bible reading plans accompanied by insightful reflections and audio-guided meditations. So whether you're a seasoned Bible reader or just starting your journey, Hallow provides a platform for you to engage with Scripture like never before. Studying the Bible's literary brilliance has influenced countless writers, poets, and artists throughout history. By studying the Bible, you'll gain a deeper appreciation for the power of storytelling, symbolism, and metaphor, enriching your understanding of literature across all genres. The Hallow app also helps you connect with a community of like-minded individuals, sharing experiences, insights, and encouragement along the path to spiritual growth. So download the app for free at hallow.com slash Candice, and you'll get three months free. That's hallow.com slash Candice. I want to move now to the Netflix spin on the $36 million narrative. Really what this gets into is Penny Bernstein, years ago, obviously, she survives a sexual assault. And she works with somebody to create a sketch of what the person looks like that committed this crime. They line up a bunch of men, one of them being Stephen Avery. Why Why Stephen Avery? Because Stephen Avery is somebody local who had been in a lot of trouble you know, before. <laughs> Stephen Avery also was uh, spending six years in prison for... Uh, putting a gun to his cousin via marriage and a toddler in the car. You know, this is not a guy that was just plucked up out of obscurity is what I mean to say. Kind of looks like him. Penny is certain this is the guy that sexually assaulted her. Penny says, yes, 100%. She testifies against him, says that this happens. I think what people didn't understand and what we showed is he had a very, very, very high mountain to scale in order to win this $36 million lawsuit. 
you have to be able to prove that the police officers, despite knowing pretty much that you were not the person that was right, and this is pre-DNA evidence, so it wasn't like they had anything to attest against, they trusted this victim that she accurately recalled the person. And of course, because of that, didn't widen their search. I am convinced he would not have won this $36 million lawsuit. I am convinced that his lawyer advised him that he would not win this $36 million lawsuit because the police weren't in it to put him in prison. They were in it to help this woman find who aggressed her, and she was certain that he had done it, and she was incredibly remorseful for what she had done when, when, when he came out. She said that she would live with that guilt for the rest of her life. She genuinely made a mistake. The mistake was not the police officer's mistake, which is what he would have had to prove in, in court, how did you feel learning that he had settled this lawsuit, first and foremost, and about the idea that this really wasn't the police officer's fault in the first place, that Penny thought that she had the right person? Right, yeah, it's, it's very complicated because you know you have the original um, Making a Murderer documentary where they present certain facts, and, and, and it's, it can be very confusing unless you were in the courtroom hearing both sides um, because it appeared, of course, his attorneys made the claim that he needed some money to continue to fight. And so he settled for 450,000 or something like that. So he can keep paying them to continue to fight. You, you are 100% correct on an uphill battle. The, the burden is on him to prove, you know, to a higher degree. And I think in a civil lawsuit, it'll be the preponderance of evidence, meaning he has 51% of the evidence on his side to prove that they were malice and they did something um, that was significant enough beyond acting in good faith, meaning that they intentionally picked him, intentionally coerced this person, mm. intentionally did this, and it wasn't just an accident because clearly they messed up. But if you have a witness point a person out of the lineup. Yeah, how did they mess up? Because this is a pre-DNA evidence the, world, the, right? The, so if they had, right. if they were able to test it, then you'd say, okay, you could have tested and realized that yeah. despite her testimony, she was completely wrong. It's hard for us to imagine now because we have forensics. Yeah. The only argument that they would have is if they there were other leads that they did not explore and they were malicious in it. Meaning that if they had decided because Stephen Avery has an incredibly terrible record of, of violence and burning cats and um, doing a lot of stuff in a small town. Everybody knows the Averys and everybody knows that Stephen Avery has issues. And if they started the investigation saying it must be him and then they build facts around that, that could be a way that he could win. Um, it's unclear if that's even the case. It's very difficult to win an uphill battle when you have an eyewitness mm -hmm. who gets raped she or, or gets sexually assaulted and she has a, a, a sketch expert when she's testifying what the man looked like. The sketch expert, according to his testimony, he draws up a person and it happened to look just like Stephen Avery. Mm -hmm. They that's the reason why he was in the lineup in the first place because right. the sketch artist drew a picture that looked just like him. Based on Penny's description. Right. So right. it's like, what, right. what so did it's, the police it's, do here? It would be very difficult. But I would say this, the only chance he would have is if he could um, illustrate impropriety and it had momentum from the media. Mm. Because if the media is, is putting pressure on the city, a lot of times what they would do is settle. Mm. But in a case where you think a citizen is going to come up against a city, that has tax dollars to pay for their defense, and you got a, 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 a I don't know, you, you hire some cheap guy that's gonna, that don't have a lot of experience, it's gonna be incredibly difficult. That's the difference between going to trial and fighting the city versus a settlement. And we've seen this happen in the case with Michael Brown and these other cases where the city settles mm. and they do not have fault. So they just give them the money because they don't want to go through the process. That does not mean that they did anything wrong. Mm. And so in his case, if if the media could have picked it up enough to put pressure on the city, they settle with him, he would win. Mm. It's nearly impossible for him to win if he's going to go toe to toe, especially him as a person. He he's not he's not the brightest guy and in the, in the, he's not the brightest you know person on the block. And so he's definitely not going to be a good witness for himself. Mm -hmm. He's not going to be able to get on the stand and articulate himself. So I think it would have been to your point a, a, a very difficult position for him to actually win that, that amount of money. Right. As many of you know, I am constantly traveling. Being on the road as much as I am, I don't always sleep great at night, probably because the hotel bedding is not as comfortable as my Buffy bedding back at home. Now that I'm getting ready to welcome another baby, I need as much sleep as I can possibly get. Buffy's bedding is some of the softest you will ever try. Not just that, their sheets are made from eucalyptus and are naturally cool to the touch, which means that you don't have to worry about being a hot sleeper. Buffy is on a mission to help you live comfortably without making our planet uncomfortable. That's why they use earth-friendly materials to create more sustainable products. 
from the first sketch to the last stitch and beyond. They don't just help you feel good today, they contribute to a really good tomorrow. So upgrade your bedding with the Breeze Sheet Set by Buffy. Go to Buffy.co and use code Candice for 25% off your first order. That's Buffy.co, promo code Candice for 25% off. And I really think kind of one of the biggest bombs in this episode, which I think people were surprised to learn, was that it, there was this concept that people had in these conspiracy forums that the reason the cops potentially killed Teresa and did all of this stuff was because they didn't want to pay out this $36 million loss that was going to bankrupt the city. And it's just so factually untrue. It's just actually untrue. And I, I, I tried to make the analogy of, you know, you get into a car accident, you have car insurance, you've got car insurance, the insurance company is going to have to pay. It, yes, the car accident is your fault. But the insurance company, why would you then kill the person in the car? This is going to bankrupt me. No, it's not going to bankrupt you because you have car insurance, right? right? And people didn't understand that the insurance company would have had to pay out this lawsuit. Again, tremendous uphill battle for him to win it in the first place. Secondly, if he did win it, the insurance company was going to have to pay it out. So why on earth would the cops go through all of this effort? Oh, my goodness. So much effort, including, you know, killing someone potentially, as some people believed it, or disappearing her, plotting this evidence, you know, doing all of this stuff because they just did not, like, they were just like, I care about Geico so much. Yeah, yeah. Like, I just do not want Geico. To, it, it gets really foolish. It, it, it's very, I'm telling you and, you, you, and you know this, obviously, and this is why you created this documentary to kind of debunk the things that was said in the original one. It's very difficult when you watch the original one to not think that they had it out to get him. Mm -hmm. However, you you have to be balancing your perspective. You have to say, yeah, it sounds very compelling. Yeah, they it seems like they may have had a motive to be biased against him. But you, you have to also think it is crazy <laughs> to think that they would have to use the the murder of somebody, plant bones and chart body parts and <laughs> It, it, it could happen, but it's highly unlikely to that they have to go through that process when Stephen Avery was already kind of a degenerate, mm -hmm. and it was only a matter of time before he do something that, potentially do something else to get his to, to land him in jail or for him not to win this case. And the police officers personally should not have the investment in trying to defend the city in a lawsuit. It's not like somehow they're going to have to pay out of their pockets. The department may be shamed. They already got enough shame for convicting them wrongly in the first place. Mm -hmm. So going through murdering somebody is very difficult to believe that they may not have just any kind of murder. Far. It's like, you know, I mean, she was she was charged. She I mean, was she was shot, stabbed, raped twice. Allegedly, like, you know, thrown into a burn pit charred in his back. It's, it's just a lot, you know, and I'm trying yeah. to think if there's ever been a case ever where where much. the police That's officers went through that much effort you, you gotta, to protect the insurance company, ever. They're, they're a podunk. This is kind of like a podunk town, right? I mean, Stephen Avery, and they're, they're not very sophisticated people. They're not, they don't have a lot of money. And so for them to pull off the greatest, <laughs> the greatest. The greatest framing in American history would take a lot of manpower, resources, and, and a lot of technical intelligence. And you got to have the family in on it, as we're going to start yeah, to yeah. see. It's like now, it's like there's a lot. You, gotta, you know, the, fam the family's got eyewitness reports. I mean, you just would literally need... Yeah, and it's... <laughs> but, but see, Candace, too, it's hard because it's like, you think, why in the world would a police, police department do that? It seems not... It seems possible, but not plausible. But why in the would Stephen Avery do it? Right. The guy is literally free. He, he spent 18 years in, in prison, uh, much of which was he was wrongly convicted of. He was free. He was living his life. I mean, he was going to get a little money. Mm -hmm. I mean, four hundred fifty thousand dollars is not for him. Is like well, you should be able problem. to answer this question because the, the criminals. They, they first off, criminals tend to be stupid. You <laughs> know what I mean? The recidivism rates are high for a reason. They get right back out yeah. and they commit the next crime. And you go, why on earth you just got out? Right. You know why would you go within two seconds and go rob a store? We see this. That actually makes sense. Crime is being committed over and over and over again, and especially which is why it was so significant in those first episodes to unpack his history with his niece. You know, you're also dealing with someone who has a history of sexual deviancy, a history of violence, no doubt, you know, stemming from animals to human beings. So, you know, he is the kind of person that we see that never really leaves the system. And he had it from juvie oh. all the way back. And yeah, he would have had a little bit of money. The family wasn't broke, even though that was kind of how making a murderer made it seem. They had this massive lot. Um, they had another property that was that was further away. So 
we, to understand the mind of a criminal and why they keep committing crimes is easier than to, poli- to believe that that many police officers were involved in what would only be described as utter like psychopathology. You'd have to be a psychopath, really. Yeah, yeah. To, to all of them would have to be psych- Nobody had a moral conscience. Right. We're just we're just going to kill this girl, burn her, do all of this because yeah, we love Geico. That's so far. That's so far fetched. <laughs> like, like I said, it's possible, but it's not. Criminals plausible. committing crimes. But one thing that people are not considering too is that, like you said, the recidivacy rate. It, it, it happens when you when a person is incarcerated because when you go to jail, that's not normal. Mm. Sometimes people go and they get messed up in there. Sometimes they go and they get cold and they, they probably come out angry and they're not the same person that they were when they went in. Mm. And that's why people recidivate. Yeah. Because they get messed up, they get institutionalized, they, be, they become hardened, they got to defend themselves in prison. So maybe Stephen Avery potentially was bad, but he wasn't that bad. But after going to prison for 18 years and uh, for something you didn't do for the most part, mm. he may have gotten out and he may have been a lot worse than when he went in. So it's not yeah. too far-fetched to believe that when he got out, he may have been dealing with some issues. It's not like they're going to counseling. Mm. It's not like somebody is, is consulting him and talking to him and helping him. His IQ was very low and and, and like- Which is, it, by the way, criminals do tend to have a low right. IQ because you think you get, how do you think you're going to get away with this? You know, they, they do tend to be very low IQ. So it could be very possible. The difference between a white collar crime right. and just like a crime on the street. You and know? it could be very possible that he was out impulsive. Of, out of, I mean, the letters right. he was writing in prison right. to his kids: "When I get out, I'm going to kill your mommy." Right. In an instance where he sees the girl there and he gets horny and he say, "I'm just going to, I'm just going to have sex with her because I don't know his wife is not there." He could have done that, and then in a sheer panic. He has to go and try to cover up the evidence, but he's too stupid to go and get rid of the car, take the the decals off the car. It looked like they removed the license plate, but he he left the decals on the car. He could have rusted it up. He could have took the hood off the car. I mean, they're in a junkyard. He could he could have destroyed the car. Right. Maybe they could have smashed the car. He could have set the car on fire. Mm-hmm. And he could have got rid of the keys. He could have flushed keys down the toilet. I mean, he could be stupid enough potentially, that he would kill her, char her body, but then be dumb enough to not get rid of the other evidence, leaving himself susceptible to going to prison. Yeah, well, you only had so much time before people were looking for her and they were right. calling that property, you know? And I think he ran, I think one of the big things is he simply just ran out of time and that he had intended to get rid of more evidence. And when we get into Brennan Dassey's testimony, yeah, it's that's, really that's gonna show people. That is um, yeah, because <laughs> Brennan Dassey, also obviously low IQ, and you, he couldn't have made up the things that he that perfectly locked in. That's why I'm saying the police would have then had to also brainwash Brennan Dassey. I'm giving way too much away. I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, medical establishment has been disregarding the lives of innocent babies for decades now. Many have grown callous because it seems surreal to think that over 64 million babies have been lost. Preborn will not stand silent, nor should we. You cannot stand by and let babies die at the hand of abortion, and that is why preborn exists to stand up for those who cannot defend themselves. The only defense for these precious babies is their heartbeat, which begins at just three weeks and can be heard on ultrasound by five weeks. So I was just getting on my feet and I met someone and I got pregnant and I wasn't ready. How am I gonna raise a baby? And I barely can take care of my daughter and myself right now. I Googled abortions and I scheduled an appointment thinking it was an abortion clinic. They did my first ultrasound. Seeing the the ultrasound, it impacted me to the point to where I broke down crying. The nurse reminded me that it was a blessing from God. I was thinking about if I wanted to keep the baby or not. When I was at the clinic, after they told me how far along I was and that the baby had a heartbeat, I cried and they gave me a minute by myself in the room. I broke down and I prayed to God. I asked the Lord to, when I walk out of those doors, to just give me the strength to be able to go through the pregnancy. Made my decision at that time. Women's Center called me out of the blue and said that they had a lot of stuff for me and they would like for me to come in. They gave me cribs and diapers and so much stuff. It's amazing. It touches my heart. It makes me feel special. It makes me feel like there's people in the world that does care. They gave me hope, the strength to believe in myself that I could do it. Treasure I chose because I know that she was a gift from God and she's just gonna be a treasure. I'm super grateful that I'm able to go down this journey with my daughter and I'm just super glad that I didn't have an abortion. I've learned how to trust God, how to listen to God and to trust myself and to do the right thing and not be selfish. 
It feels amazing. When a mother making the ultimate choice hears her baby's heartbeat and sees the precious life inside of her, the majority of the time, she will choose life. By sponsoring an ultrasound for a mother, you are being the voice of preborn. Please join preborn in the cause for life for just $28. You might be the difference between the life and death of a child. To donate, dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250 baby. Or you can go to preborn.com slash Candice. That's preborn.com slash Candice. I do want to quickly discuss Colburn because I think that he was, Colburn and Lank, definitely fingered by the making a murderer. These are the dirty cops. I want to say right off the bat, I met this guy. Like the concept of him being a dirty cop, <laughs> I mean, just like a very happy go lucky, very much, I felt very bad for him. That's what I want to say. I just felt very bad for him that he was kind of put, he was the person that was chosen uh, to be one of the people that was chosen to be at the center of this conspiracy theory and just how much he had to endure during this time. And he just comes across to me as like a small town officer who, gosh, I don't know why, shouldn't have done that, shouldn't have done, you know. But let's just take a look at another clip from the show regarding Colburn and Officer Lank's involvement. You've gone over... Uh what is Exhibit 138? Yes, sir. It describes you receiving a telephone call from someone uh, who identified himself as a detective. When I received the call, I answered the phone, Manitowoc County Jail. I didn't say Sheriff's Office. I said Manitowoc County Jail, Officer Colbert. He must have assumed that I was a police officer. He didn't give me his name. He just said, I'm a detective from this agency. The detective indicated that there was a person in custody who had made a statement about a Manitowoc County offense, correct? Yes. Okay. He didn't say sexual assault, and he didn't give me a name of the suspect. And what that person in custody had said was that he had committed an assault in Manitowoc County and someone else was in jail for it, correct? Yes, sir. Didn't say prison in our jail who may have committed an assault in your guy's jurisdiction. Was that a matter to shrug off for you? I didn't shrug it off, sir. I did what the caller asked me to do, connect him to a detective. I think I said to him, you're probably gonna to wanna to talk to a detective. I said, let me transfer you, and then transferred the call. That was the end of it. Uh, it wasn't within your jurisdiction to take it any further, correct? No, sir. When I watched Making a Murderer, I can tell you right out that I thought he was absolutely wrong about how he handled it. He should have followed up, absolutely. Did you ever write a report about that? No, I did not, sir. I felt like that, coupled with the fact that the report was written after the fact, really bothered me. Well, actually you did, didn't you? It was about eight years later, wasn't it? I wrote a statement on it, yes sir. After I transferred the call, I really didn't think about it because on an average time working four hours in that control, you probably transfer 20 to 30 phone calls in a four hour period, you know, every time you work in there. Of course, Andy Colburn didn't initially make a report when he took this phone call. This isn't a huge gotcha moment that making a murderer was trying to make it out to be because Andy Colburn was not a police officer at that time. He was just working at the jail. His job was to literally transfer phone calls. Well, let me ask you this, as you sit here today, Sergeant Colburn, do you even know whether that call was about Mr. Stephen Avery? No, I don't. So I think people that watched Making a Murderer came away with the impression that Coburn was a police officer at the time who answered a phone call. So he was involved, knew that this guy had called regarding Stephen Avery and declined to file a report. Actually, turns out he was literally just working in the phone control room. He was transferring calls. He gets a phone call. There's no names that are mentioned. And he does the right thing and transfers it to a detective who should have there then made a report. It was literally just not within his job title to make a report regarding this. And they really were able to convince viewers that it somehow was. Right, and, and, and I think that that's problematic, right? Because they shouldn't have left out that important detail. 
because even when I watched it, I thought he was a cop. Mm -hmm. Because when he's being deposed, he's wearing uniform. Mm -hmm. and Tricky. He, he Tricky made, editing. He, right. He had made mention that he was an officer to the person on the phone. Mm -hmm. They didn't go through and classify that he wasn't a sworn officer at the time. And I've been in policing. We have people who are not sworn that are working in our uh, front desk and things like that. It, it, it would not make sense for a person in that position to take concern about a detective calling him to say anything right. because it's above his pay grade. A person talking to a detective need to refer to a supervisor or a detective. Right. They wouldn't say, oh, let me get the information because they have no idea what a detective need. They have no idea the functionality of the police department and they have no idea what cases are being investigated. So it, they made it out to seem like he was a functioning officer mm. that had something to do with Stephen Avery or it was known that Stephen Avery was wrongly convicted and he's getting this call in and he's like, oh, I don't want to say nothing because we got the guy and we don't want to mess this up and look bad. When in fact, from what you've been able to prove, which is crucial, that this guy wasn't an officer. He wasn't in the capacity to take a case report. He did exactly what he should have done, referred him to a detective. Mm -hmm. Now, the detective associated with this, whatever he did, right. should be counted as a problem or not. That dude working in the jail is not going to know any details about Stephen Avery. There's probably people call all the time and make false reports, lie try to get out of jail by claiming that they committed crimes that mm -hmm. they didn't. And they said assault, they didn't even specifically say sexual assault. Right. Assault can be a physical assault. You could have meant you punched somebody in the face and ran away and somebody else got in trouble for it. So he just transferred the call. And this became such a huge conspiracy theory that he was somehow involved in the Stephen Avery case when it was first going on, and he just simply wasn't. But which one is more sexy? It's yeah. that <laughs> you think he a cop, and he's got a got the real killer on the phone, yeah. and he's like, "Don't tell anybody," <laughs> you know. And, and so, of course, they this you know omission of of certain things that lets you do the deductive reasoning to to lead yourself into believing something that's not true. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's it. I think it should have been called instead of making a murder or just making it sexy. Yeah, yeah. We're just trying to make it sexy for you guys. Making the murder sexy. And they did. They were successful. They made it the murder was, I, sexy and people were invested and they believed yes. in it. And it's so great to just be getting so many tweets from people that are saying, like, I'm completely mind blown. Everything that I thought actually is not the way that it is. All right, guys, we are going to have to wrap there. Episode six airs next Thursday, and we have a little teaser for you guys. I hope that I didn't give away too many spoilers. Take a look. Coming up on Convicting a Murderer. The key was the biggest piece of evidence that viewers to this day believe was planted. It was a story that was really tailor-made for Hollywood. He was on TV constantly saying, it's Manitowoc County, they're framing me. It's gotta be a setup, because if I didn't do it, they had a plan to stop. It seemed like almost everyone believed these filmmakers. What do we want? Justice! What do we want to do? His body language comes across as very suspicious. It looked like he was caught. And that is exactly what the filmmakers led you to believe. Why are you editing my courtroom testimony? You should be still faithful to the facts. I started to realize more and more that this was an entertainment piece. This wasn't a piece of journalism like I thought it was going to be. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time that we have for today. We'll see you next week. Have a great weekend.